Take your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading. James chapter 1, if you would please. James chapter 1. James 1, we're going to read verses 21 through 25. James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25, and we'll read them responsibly, as we normally do, begin together on verse 21, and I'll read 22, and we'll alternate till we end together on verse number 25 of James chapter 1. As our custom is, let's stand together <clears throat> to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 21 of James chapter 1. Ready? Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful singing tonight. Music has been a blessing to my soul, and I trust to a blessing to you as well as we've sung with melody and grace in our hearts unto you. Thank you for each one that's here this evening, Lord, and we're asking you to bless the special now, and that it would minister to our hearts and would put our heart in tune with your heart, God, that we would all have ears to hear what you would want to say to us this evening. So, Lord, bless the special to that end. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. I've been to lots of places, and I've seen a lot of faces. There have been times I felt so all alone. But in my lonely hours, yes, there's precious lonely hours, Jesus let me know that I was his own. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Yes, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Amen. Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to open up your word together. I want to thank you again for the Bible tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege to have copies of your word in our hands tonight. 
Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to receive your word tonight, mixed with faith, that it may profit those of us who are listening. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to receive your word tonight, not as the words of men or the words of a man, but as it is in truth, the words of God. And as we look at how we can better understand our Bible and how you can reveal your truth to us, Lord, may each one be receptive to the truth tonight. And I pray we'll have some things tonight that will help us to not just know your word better, but to know you better, because we know your word better. So bless our time in your word tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I told you this morning I want to talk to you about how to better understand your Bible. And maybe for some I hope it will be a better understanding. For some it may just be understanding. I read a poll recently that, believe it or not, said, I think it was over 60% or 70% of Americans believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. However, only there was about 80% in the poll of Americans who said they read the Bible once a month. Not, not, not once a week, once a month. However, when polled, those people could not name the four Gospels. They could not name the first four books of the Bible. So while they may read it, in fact, uh, they did not know much about it. And uh, certainly, reading it once a month isn't going to help you. Okay? The truth is, though, I think there's people in churches and in good churches who read the Bible, but what I hear most of the time when people read the Bible is, well, I read the Bible, but I didn't get anything from it. Or I don't remember what I read. And, and we're just not receiving what we need to. To be sure, if you're going to grow as a Christian, you've got to have a knowledge of the Bible. You will not grow as a believer if you don't grow in God's Word. You'll never be a growing Christian if you neglect your Bible. Is this on? You'll never be a growing Christian if you neglect your Bible. Okay, a, uh, Someone said, These hath God married, and no man shall part dust on the Bible and hardness in your heart. There's a great truth to that. But now you understand, it's not enough just to know facts about the Bible. There are people who have read the Bible and can know the, the facts of the Bible, but they don't know the Lord of the Bible. And it's the purpose, the purpose of the Bible is that we get to not just know about God, but we get to know God. There are people, you can backslide with a Bible under your arm. You can, I remember going off to Bible college and being talked to by my pastor and warning me that you can backslide at Bible college. You think, whoa, uh, how can that happen? Well, because you hear the Bible every day. You have chapel every day. You have, uh, you know, Bible classes every day. And so you can, you can let that substitute for your own personal time with God. And therefore you can backslide. In James chapter 1, if your Bible's still open there, I'm going to have to turn this just a little bit for me. God's going to give us four things here that will help us to understand our Bible. We're going to start in verse number 21 where the Bible says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, you read that and you think, wait a minute, look up at verse number 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, what's the next two words, church? My brethren... Who is James writing to? He's writing to Christians. He's writing to believers. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Didn't he just say it's able to save our souls? Say, so why is he talking about saving our souls if we're already brethren? If we're brethren, we're saved. So how does he mean it can save our souls? Well, you understand our salvation 
is is involves three tenses, so to speak. We are we are saved from our past sins. We're saved from all of our sins, by the way, past, present, and future. But it is a past that takes care of the penalty of sin. What Jesus Christ did on the cross delivers us from the penalty of sin, which is death and hell. That's the the past tense of salvation. In that sense, I have been saved. But there's a present tense to salvation, and that is, I am in the process of being saved. What is that? From the power of sin in my life. There's no reason for a Christian to live under the power of sin. Romans 6 verse 12, Let not sin reign therefore in your mortal body. What's reign mean? Reign means it rules. It it controls. It's in charge. How, How come I don't have to let that happen? If you're a believer and sin is ruling your life, you're letting that happen. It is not, he does not have authority to rule or reign in your life anymore. Why? Christ conquered sin. Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He's undefeated, folks. He never loses against sin. And so we yield ourselves to Him. We can have power over sin in our life. Amen? So that's past, that's present, but there's a future tense of salvation. And that comes a day when we are going to have the redemption of our body and we'll be delivered from the possibility of sinning. We'll be delivered from the presence of sin, but it won't be possible for us to sin. Won't that be a great day? Get to heaven and there's no more temptation and no more dealing with the body of sin and the body of flesh. Uh, We'll simply be there to enjoy God. And so we have that past, present, and future tense of salvation. I like what the Sunday school teacher asked a little girl. Is there anything that God cannot do? And the little girl thought for a minute, and then she gave a pretty astounding answer. She said, yes, God cannot see my sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's pretty profound, isn't it? And God can't do that. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So in that sense, you understand, the Word of God saves our souls saves our souls now you understand our soul is our mind our will and our emotions what i think what i want what i feel and god's able to to save that and god's able to change that in other words listen my mind my will my emotions are all to be controlled by god's word every one of those brought under the control of the word of god so don't Don't get in situations and react wrong, react contrary to God's Word, and somebody brings you the Word of God and you respond with, well, you don't know how I feel. I I got sympathy for you, but the truth is, can I be kind? It doesn't matter how you feel. Okay? What does God's Word say? Are you bringing your emotions underneath the authority of God's Word? Are your emotions over top of God's Word. We, we, we deal sometimes with charismatic individuals. I, I don't mean charismatic personalities. I mean charismatic in doctrine, Pentecostal, speaking in tongue individuals. They believe in speaking in other languages. They're very emotional. We've had people, I've had, when you go to the Scriptures with folks like that, I've had them say, I don't care what the Bible says, I know what I've experienced. What are they doing? They're relying on their emotions over top of the Word of God. And, and we, can't, we can't say they're wrong there and then rely on our emotions in other areas. Or, well, I know what the Bible says, but I just don't think, well, then I'm letting what I think overrule what the Bible says. See? It has to I bring my soul under the authority of God's Word. So we have to receive God's Word. Notice what it says in verse 21 again. Lay apart all filthiness. We're going to deal with this in just a moment. It says, with superfluity of naughtiness, and notice, receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. We have to receive the Word of God. Receive it. doesn't mean grasp it. doesn't mean reach out and grab it. It means to welcome it. Welcome the Word of God into your heart. It's with two hands 
that we receive it and we warmly receive them. You know, you, it isn't, it isn't this. You say, hi, Bobby, how are you? No, no, no. You know what it is? It's, hey, Bobby, how are you? Boy, it's good to see you. See, that's welcoming. Welcoming the word of God. That's the difference in the, in the words. You don't, you don't just go and attack. There's people who can say, okay, I'm going to find out what the Bible says. And they get down and they open it up and they get some dictionaries and some Bible uh, commentaries and they're going to attack the Bible and figure out what it says. Uh, they're never going to understand what it says. Never going to get what it says. You welcome the Word of God. And open, open your mind, your will, and your emotions to God's Word. So I want to receive what you have for me. Now there's four ways he gives us here in this passage that we welcome the Word of God. And, and things that we must have to receive from His Word what we should and to better understand God's Word. All right? Number one is a repentant heart. Verse 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. You see, there's, there's a moral qualification to beginning to understand God's Word. And it has to do with laying apart or repenting of some things in our life. Um, we have to lay aside superfluity of naughtiness. Now, there's a word you hear every week, isn't it? Uh, I'm sure you can think of all the times you use superfluity of naughtiness. And uh, that's not a daily expression uh, that we use. <clears throat> but what it means is literally that which remains or that which is left over. That's literally what it's talking to. So it's, it's sort of like residual sin that is left over in our life. When, when you got saved, you, you asked Christ to forgive you of your sin. You uh, put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And He forgave you, and He gave you the gift of eternal life. But you know what? There was a lot you didn't know about Jesus when you got saved. But I got news for you of something else. There was a lot you didn't know about yourself when you got saved. And there were some things in your life that you thought were okay. And once you grew, and once you got to know Jesus a little better, and you got to know His Word a little better, you found out, hey, I got some other stuff that doesn't need to be in my life. I got some other things that need to go residual things left over that, I, that was there when I got saved. And now uh, I have to get rid of those things. When Lazarus came out of the grave, Lazarus come forth and he comes out and he had the grave clothes on. In fact, one of the, his sisters commented, Lord, has been dead four days by now. He stinks. Okay? And so Jesus said, come forth. He comes forth and you know what he said? Loose him and let him go. Get those old rags off him and let him go. Once you get saved, we get saved with some of those old rags still on us. And God, you know what the Lord does? He begins to get those old rags off of us. And we begin to repent. When God shows you something that's wrong in His Word, you listen to Him. And you repent. You turn. You, repentance is simply you changing your mind. When someone repents, they're changing their mind of what they thought would take them to heaven to believing in Jesus, that He's the way to take them to heaven. Somebody says, you've got to repent of all your sins to be saved. That would be impossible. You don't even know what all your sins are. The sin you repent of is your sin of unbelief in Jesus or your sin of believing in something else other than Jesus to get you to heaven. I've done far more repenting after I got saved than I did before I got saved. Turning from sin and turning away, changing my mind about what I thought was okay that God says isn't okay. You know, it's um, interesting. <clears throat> All of us have some superfluity of naughtiness. Things that remain in us from when we got saved that we have not repented and turned from being willing to listen to what God has to say, wanting to have a repentative heart. You're willing to agree with God about sin? 
Willing to agree with God that if He says it's wrong, it's wrong? You're willing to, to change your mind, again, submitting your mind, your will, your emotions to God's Word? Where if that's what God says, He's right and I'm wrong. And you'll turn from that. Superfluity of naughtiness. But notice it says, you turn, lay apart, not just superfluity of naughtiness, but filthiness. Filthiness. It's interesting. The, the word for that is, is a word that means earwax. Isn't that exciting? But it's, if you want to hear, sometimes you've got to clean out your ears. Some people have more of an issue. I won't have you raise your hand. I won't embarrass you. But some people have more problem with earwax than others. And some people can get big globs of earwax in their ears and it makes it difficult to hear. And until you get it cleaned out, and it's amazing sometimes what can, uh, you find is in the ear. You're not going to hear if your ears are stopped up. And so... Sometimes the reason we don't hear God's Word is we've got that residual sin that has stayed over in our life and it shuts out. We don't hear the still, small voice of God. And therefore we read and we think, man, nothing there for me. I didn't get anything out of that. The problem, the problem isn't there. The problem's here. The problem's on the receiving end. By welcoming the word, by laying apart the filthiness and the superfluity of naughtiness that is, that is in my heart. We can sing, fill my cup, Lord, fill it up, Lord. But if the cup's dirty, as we talked about this morning, if the vessel's filthy, if the vessel's dirty, there's no filling it up. You're not a vessel fit for the Master's use. And so the first qualification is to have a repentant heart. To receive the Word, to welcome the Word, you've got to have a repentant heart. If God shows me something that isn't right, He's right and I'm wrong. Okay? Number two, the second thing we have to have is a receptive heart. Also, verse 21. The Bible says that we lay apart all filthiness and superfluitive naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted Word. We're receiving the Word. And we're receiving it how? With meekness. Meekness is, is not, not weakness, okay? But meekness is having a teachable spirit. Being willing, <clears throat> willingly submitting to authority. That's meekness. And it's a fruit of the Spirit, by the way. That means naturally, we don't want to do that. Naturally, we don't like somebody telling us what to do. But when you receive Christ your Savior and the Holy Spirit comes in and you want to be under the control of the Holy Spirit, one of the fruit of the Spirit is meekness. And He will help you to submit to God's authority. Not balk at authority. You know, when you, when you get a wild horse and you train that horse, they, they get on it and they're, they're breaking that horse. You remember what they call that? You're meeking the horse. What are you trying to do? Get them to submit to the rider. That though, listen, that though they're big and powerful, that guy on top is in control. And, and, and we want to have a teachable spirit when it comes to God. So the first question, God said, you want to receive more from my word? Understand my word? Number one, are you clean? Number two, are you teachable? Are you meek? Look at John chapter 7. Hold your finger or put a piece of paper there in, in James 1. We're going to come back to that. Look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7, please. <clears throat> Look what he says here in John 7 and verse 17. John 7 verse 17. If any man will do his will... He shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. It's a matter of a surrendered will. If you will to do His will, you receive. 
you receive with a repentant spirit, but then you have to receive it with a receptive spirit that I'm willing to be taught. I'm willing to, to show, listen, I'm willing to show that I'm wrong and I'm willing to listen to what's right. The very first verse that the RU students memorize in the, their first book, the Overcomer Workbook, is Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, for he will have mercy upon him. First thing you do, are you willing to forsake your way? And are you willing to forsake your thoughts? Your way has got you where you are right now. I've, it's so easy. It's so fun to preach to guys in prison. It is. I mean, you can get a point like this. You know what? I say, guys, you've done it your way. How's that work for you? Yeah, they're sitting in their prison blues. They know that this is where it got me. Isn't it time to forsake your way and go God's way? Hey, isn't it time to forget your thoughts? Hey, and that means, see, in recovery, it means, for are you willing to forsake your thoughts about how you ought to recover and do it God's way? There are some who blow by that verse and they, they memorize that verse, but they never do really grasp what, what that... That's a foundational verse. That's why it's the first one you got. But that's not just for addicts, though everybody in the room here is an addict. Anything we do that we know isn't good for us and we do it anyway is an addiction. So, so are you willing to forsake your way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and do it God's ways? And do it, do, it, do it God's way. So am I receptive to God's Word? Am I teachable? Years ago, I had a guy in church and Brother Schmael, you know, he, he, he started missing Sunday night. So I went to visit him. Ask him why he wasn't coming on Sunday night anymore. You know what he said? Oh, I already know what you're going to say. That's an amazing thing because I didn't know what I was going to say. But you know, all, all he was saying was, he's, he doesn't have a teachable spirit. In other words, there's nothing you're going to say that's going to teach me anything. You see? And, and so what's going to happen when you approach God that way, His Word you're not going to get any understanding of His Word. You have to be teachable. You have to be receptive, okay? I see what's wrong, and I repent of that. Now I'm willing to be shown what's right. And God will always show you what's right. He doesn't just reproof. He gives you instruction in righteousness. That's what the Word of God does, okay? So we have a repentant heart. We have a, a uh, receptive heart. And then go back to James chapter 1, if you would please, and notice with me verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now we have to have a responsive heart. A responsive heart. Once you get your heart clean, repentance and you surrender to God you say I want to do what you want me to do I want to obey what you want me to do and then I'm going to do what the Bible says the Bible says if I hear it and I don't do it I'm deceiving myself I'm, I'm, I'm playing games with God and there's no bigger fool than someone who's self-deceived many people in churches today they come to church, they sit, and they soak. You know what happens when something sits and soaks long enough? Yeah, it starts souring. It's not very pleasant to be around. It really begins to smell. And that's what happens if you never apply what you hear. If you just listen and you hear, but you never obey. You want to have a responsive Spirit. Jesus said you need to not just hear the Word, but you need to obey the Word. Now, I want you to, again, put a paper there or something. Look over at Matthew chapter 7. 
Would you turn there? First book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 7. These are the words of Jesus here. Notice verse number 26. Matthew 7, verse 26. Jesus says this, Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a, what kind of man, church? A foolish man. So, look at me. Jesus says, if you hear it and you don't do it, Jesus says, you're a fool. No, I didn't say that. But Jesus said that. Just saying. Verse 26. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings the people were astonished at His doctrine for He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He's talking about doing the Word and not just hearing the Word. He said, Blessed are they that hear the Word of God and keep it. Obey it. God never blesses people for the Bible they know. He blesses you for the Bible you live. You must obey God's Word. You must do it with a responsive heart. You know, it's there's every preacher... If you know, and and it's nice to hear when you stand at the back of the church in the morning. People walk out. It's it's nice when people say good message, nice me- good sermon, you know things like that. That's fine. It, you know, don't don't be like one lady this morning said. When you uh, what did she say? You need a vacation or something like that. Yeah. All these people are saying nice message. I bet she goes, you need a vacation. I said, oh thanks. All right. Must have been a tough one for no, and she was teasing. She meant she meant when are we going on vacation, and wanted to make sure she came that Sunday probably. But uh, the uh, <laughs> we listen, uh, those are fine. But you know the best compliment you ever give the pastor is when you live the message he preached. When you live it out, God isn't God isn't so concerned when you tell him how wonderful he is and how great he is and how marvelous he is that's okay and that's good but it doesn't mean anything if you don't do what he says if you don't obey if you're not responsive to his word if if you don't recall the last time god ever spoke to your heart and you you fell out to come to the altar and pray or you at least ought to bow your seat and pray you have a heart issue There ought to be responsiveness to your heart and responsiveness to the Word of God. Years ago, there was a famous actor who was in a crowded theater. They came to hear him and a fire had broken out in one of the wings of the theater. The manager came to the actor and he told him, we have a potentially very bad situation here. There's a fire. It's not out of control. But if the people smell the smoke and they hear the word fire, they're all going to head for the exit and we could have a catastrophe. They've come to hear you. I suggest you go out on the platform and you tell them about the fire, but tell them in such a way that they'll leave in an orderly fashion and not trample one another. So the great actor, according to this story, came to the platform and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I have an announcement to make. Give me your attention. I do not want there to be any undue harm, but I want you to listen carefully. A small fire is broken out in the, th- in the theater. There's plenty of time for all of us to leave. So I'm going to ask you that right now we stand in an orderly way and we vacate the premises. You know what the crowd did? They all applauded. Wonderful. Wonderful. Fine job. Fine job. They thought it was part of his act. Just a story. So he came at it a second time and said, listen, this is real. This isn't part of the act. In fact, he got down on his knees and with tears streaming down his face, said, please, for your safety, leave the theater. 
And they stood and applauded and said, Bravo! Bravo! Isn't it wonderful? Look at his tears. Bravo! But they thought it was just a story. But that's how many people come and listen to the preacher. Bravo! Boy, good point. In fact, a lot of, a lot of your, your mega churches and TV churches, that's what they do and the pastor makes a good point. They applaud. By the way, that's crazy. Don't you ever do that. And don't you're probably saying, don't worry, you'll never make a good point. I understand, but you know, in case that ever happens, all right? Just say amen, all right? That's what the amen's for. But you know, a lot of people sit and listen to the preacher. They walk out the door and say, Boy, that was wonderful. Boy, that was a good message. Boy, I really enjoyed listening to that but they never ever considered doing what they've heard. Oh, that was nice to listen to. That was pleasant. I'm glad I got to hear that. Of course, not going to do anything with it. Not going to affect my life at all. I just enjoyed listening. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Now, the best way let me help you with something. The best way to understand parts of the Bible that you don't understand is to obey the parts of the Bible you do understand. I've been studying the Bible for many years. And, and you'll find that there are certain parts of the Bible that, that are difficult to grasp. And you, you, what I found out as a pastor is I look at these passages and you go to a commentary or you go to look what other men have said, you find out that most of them skip that passage as well because they didn't know for sure what it meant. They're difficult passages. But I tell you what you do, you don't focus on the parts you don't understand, focus on the parts you do. And we'll find out that as God sees you obey what you understand, He will open up more understanding. Why would God reveal more to us when we do not obey what He's already revealed to us? Why would He do that? Why would your job where you work give you more responsibility when you're not doing the responsibilities they gave you? There's not a, there's not a person, Brother Neil, for years ran a, ran a uh, you managed a shop, so to speak, and had employees. You never thought about, well, man, this guy's really lazy and he doesn't do much. Let's see if we can give him more to do. It doesn't work that way. You say, man, it, and, and why, would God, why would God look down and say, God, I want to understand more of your word. God would say, are you obeying the word you do understand? Are you obeying what I've already showed you? If God's speaking to your heart, maybe there's part of the word of God that's talking to you about being a witness and telling others of Christ. And you're holding back and you're balking at that, saying, no, nah, I'm not going to witness. I, I'm, not, I'm not a talker. Or maybe it's to surrender to missions. Surrender to be a full-time servant of God. Or maybe it's about your prayer life and prayer time. Or maybe restitution of wrongs that you've done. Whatever it may be, and you know you ought to do it, and you're holding back, I tell you what it does, it closes up God's Word to you. And I don't know about you, but I don't want that. I want, I want God's Word to, to speak to me. I want to know what His Word says. You see, what happens, look at John chapter 14, would you please? John chapter 14. And listen carefully, I'm going to make a statement to you. When you, <clears throat> when you study the Bible... <clears throat> It will only give you knowledge about God. It's when you obey that you get to know God. The goal of the Christian life, are you listening? The goal of the Christian life isn't just to know about God. There are, there are people who I, you, can, you can study and you, you become fascinated. Some people are very fascinated with Abraham Lincoln or fascinated with Ronald Reagan or some different figures from history and you know what they'll know everything about that person 
doesn't mean they know that person or knew that person. And there are people, if you, if you just read the Bible and study the Bible, you'll get all the facts about God. But you will not know God until you obey the Bible. And here's where it comes, John 14, verse number 21. Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him, and what will I do? I will manifest myself to him. I'll make myself known to him. Why? Because you want to obey him. See, when Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. A yoke is for two not for one. And you yoke up with Christ. Jesus never wanted us just to know about Him. He wants us to know Him. And you get that through obedience. It makes God real to you. So let's see. We have number one, a repentant heart. Number two, a receptive heart. Number three, a responsive heart. And then lastly, number four, is a reflective heart. You want to receive the Word of God with a reflective heart. Back in James 1 and verse 23, the Bible says this, For if any be a hearer of the Word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. When, he, when it says that a man beholds his natural face in a glass, the natural face is that mug you got right on top of your shoulders, okay? And that glass is a mirror. You're looking at yourself in the mirror. And, and you behold yourself, it's, it's what you do when you, sometimes when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do sometimes is look in the mirror and assess the damages of the night and what, 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 what has to get done here before I presentable. Yeah, you might. What do you say amen for? Guy's got no hair on his head whatsoever, you know? He has, he has no bed head to ever deal with. None. There it is. Okay? Just have to get a rag out and shine her up a little bit, all right? And uh, you're good to go. But you know, you wouldn't get up and you, you look in the mirror and you got some you know, sleep in the corner of your eye and, and you got some hair sticking out different ways and you know, the, the breath is enough to uh, take on the Russian army. And you don't just look at that mirror and then decide, hey, good to go. And walk out. You wouldn't do that. You, you, you don't look and go your way and forget what you just saw. When you look in there, you say, whoa, we got to do something about this. This can't go out like this. And, and remember what you need to do. Whoso, the Bible says in verse 25, looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You look into the Word of God, and the Word of God's a mirror. You know that? It'll show you what you really are. You know, the someone said the mirror is different than a camera. They said a photographer, see if I can remember that statement that they, they put here. He said, a uh, photographer says, when there's beauty, we take it, and when there's none, we make it. A photographer can touch up your photo and make you look pretty decent, even when those aren't the facts. But you know what? A mirror doesn't do that. A mirror is brutally honest. And the Bible is brutally honest. 
That's why a lot of times people don't like mirrors. Don't even like to look in the mirror. But it's important that we look into the Bible because we don't just read the Bible, the Bible reads us. The Bible will tell us what needs to be done. You heard about the fella lived out in the hills. He'd never seen a mirror in his life. One day he was walking through the field and there was a small mirror, probably probably not much more the size of that, and it was laying on the ground in the field, and he picked it up and looked at it, and he said, huh, imagine that, a picture of Paul right here in the field. And he took it home and hung it up in the attic. And he would spend long periods of time up there. And his wife began to get curious. Why is he spending all this time up in the attic? So she snuck up there one time, and she saw the mirror hanging on the wall, and she went over and looked in it, and she said, so that's the old hag he's been hanging out with. <laughs> Maybe that's why you don't want to look at the mirror. You know, here it says a guy looked in the mirror, and he forgot what manner of man he was. Fellas, I don't, girls probably don't have this issue. Guys, how many of you guys... Use a, a razor for a shaver. Not electric, just a razor razor. Okay. How many of you ever cut yourself? Yeah. When you cut yourself, did you, ever, did you ever put tissue paper there? Huh? Did you ever put tissue paper there and forget you put it there? <laughs> Walk out the door? I, I know a guy who did that once. <laughs> Until he got a... Went to Speedway and got a tea and came to church and looked in the mirror and there it is sitting on my chin. I mean his chin. And uh, forgot what manner of man he was. What happened? Got distracted? Got busy? Got my mind on other things? And forgot to take care of what I need to get care of? Isn't that what happens? We look into the Word of God or we hear a message from the Word of God and you say, boy, God really dealt with my heart. Boy, I need to do something about that. And you know what happens? It's Sunday night and service is over and hey, where are we eating? Hey, you want to get ice cream? Or you come home and you pick up the remote control. Hey, what's on? And all of a sudden you forget what manner of man you were and what God wanted to do in your life. Don't, don't just look and walk away and forget what manner of man you were. He says He wants you to look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein so you won't be a forgetful hearer. When it says you, you looketh into the perfect law of liberty, you know, that, that look is, is, is used when John and Peter ran to the tomb when the women came back on resurrection morning. And John and Peter ran to the tomb and John outran him, but he wouldn't go in. The Bible says he just looked in. What he was doing was he was, he was gazing at everything. He was surveying the situation. Now Peter got there and he doesn't bother looking. He's just charging in. Get out of my way, bud. That's in the Greek. And he charged on into the tomb. And, and, but John, that intently looking, that intently gazing, don't, don't, don't say, oh, I've got to read the Bible. Okay, where am I going to read? Let's see. All right, here's, here's a chapter. All right, well, I got that done. Whatever Jeremiah 36 is talking about. Hmm? Well, that's no, not going to make sense. You know, the, do you think God is a God of order? I think He is. God says everything ought to be done decently and in order. So why would we have our Bible reading just... Okay, here's, here's what I'll read today. You don't read any other book that way. I don't, I don't pick up a, a novel or uh, some book you're reading and just say, let me just start here on page 203. You know what? Wouldn't make any sense to you either. You wouldn't know who they're talking about. God's a God of order. Systematically gaze into the Word of God. Look intently 
into the Word of God. That's why the Bible says we, we continue therein. You think God is going to take the treasures and the truths of His Word and just give them to us who are, when we're being flippant about even reading His Word? We say, well, I only got two minutes. Let me just see what I can get something. You're not going to uncover much treasure in a quick minute or two minutes. Gaze into His Word. Continue therein. It'll make the Bible real to you. Receive it. Welcome. Understand it. How? With a repentant heart. How? With a receptive heart. How? With a responsive heart. And with a reflective heart. Not forgetting what man or man is. You know, there's no shortcut to knowing God. That's hard on Americans. We want instant everything. We, we, we want to buy it on Amazon and we want to get it today. And if not, we want it tomorrow. Next day shipping. We want it fast. America invented fast food. It's horrible for us. It's made us all overweight. But we want it now. We want it fast. And, and sadly... We've tried to find shortcuts to knowing God. And there's no shortcut. Be still and know that I am God. You have to, the old songwriter had it right when he said, you have to take time to be holy and speak oft with thy God. So receive the Word of God. Get, get a place, a quiet place, a place apart from anyone else, and just you and God's Word. And take those minutes and take that time and just be alone with Him. And ask God to say, God, I want to have a repentant heart. I want to be willing to show you show me where I'm wrong. And I'll ask you to forgive me. And God, I want to, I want to have a receptive heart. I want, to, I want to receive what you have for me. I'll receive instruction. I want to have a teachable spirit. And Lord, I'll respond to what you tell me. And I'll reflect on what you show me from your Word. And I think you'll see truths from God's Word open up to you like they never have before. I think that's the secret to better understanding the Word of God. And really, not just getting to know about God, but getting to know God personally. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for this passage in James. And my, it's, it's so rich and so good for us. And Lord, I pray that tonight you would put a passion in each of our hearts to know you. Thank you for giving us your word. That we may gaze into it. Study to show ourselves approved unto God. Lord, we would come to Your Word with the right spirit and a repentant heart, a receiving heart, a responsive heart, and a reflective heart. Lord, I pray that You would begin to open up Your truths of Your Word to those who will diligently seek You. To those in the room tonight who will say, God, I'll take time to be holy. To speak off with my God. I'm not satisfied knowing facts about God. I want to know God. Speak to people's hearts to that end tonight. And I'll thank you for it. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, the Holy Spirit of God sure spoke to my heart tonight about how I can receive His Word, how I can understand His Word, how to come at it and, and come at it with the right heart attitude. 
for God to reveal himself to me. I wonder how many tonight would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. Please pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. Hands all across the auditorium. It's exciting to know what God will do in the coming days as you seek Him through His Word. In a moment I'll pray. We'll have your invitation. Why don't you respond to what God's told you to do? Take a moment and come and pray. Talk to God about what He's spoken to your heart about. Begin it this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for ministering to our hearts tonight. Spirit of God, thank you for speaking to each of us. And now I pray that each of us would do what you're bidding us to do during this invitation time. May your will be done in each heart and life.